Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Decades with Joe E. Kramer. It's 9 o'clock. Hey everybody, this is Ivan from Men Without Hats. Hi everyone, this is Russell Hitchcock of Air Supply. I'm all out of love, I'm so lost without you, I know you were right, believing for so long. Hey everybody, it's Robert Mason from War. Decades. You're listening to Decades. Let's all hang out with Joey Kramer on Decades. This is the Decades Artist Spotlight. Now, here's Joe E. Kramer with this week's artist. We are on another Decades Artist Spotlight tonight, tonight, tonight. We talk to Steve Whiteman of 80s rockers and current rockers, Kicks. Always a great guy to talk to. So we're going to have that. Uh, of course, Kicks has the 30 year anniversary last year of, um, well, You'll hear about it coming up in just a little bit. Let's get to the music first, right? Because that's what it's all about. Steve Whiteman of Kicks coming up next. Blow My Fuse, Reblown, and more. And Cold Blood. This is Hairspray. Well, not Hairspray. Any. Kind of like a second hour of Hairspray. Any. This is the Decades Artist Spotlight. Steve Whiteman of Kicks. He'll be here next.
is the Decades Artist Spotlight with Joe E. Kramer, this week's artist. We're on another Decades Artist Spotlight tonight. We welcome back to the show singer, songwriter, musician, and frontman extraordinaire, Mr. Steve Whiteman is here. How you doing, Steve? Wow, say that again. Frontman, <laughs> frontman, I'm ex- kidding. Extraordinaire. <laughs> I like it. He's, he's also in his band called Kicks. I didn't even mention that in the intro. I guess I should tell everybody that. He's the front man. That of would Kicks. help. Yeah. That would help. There you, go. you know, last time we talked a few years ago, um, Rock Your Face Off was coming out. It's hard to believe that was like, that was five years ago. 2004. Five or four. What did it come out? Did it come out in 15 or 14? I think it came out in two, August 5th, 2014. Wow. I didn't realize it's been that long either. It's been a long. I mean, I looked at it. I, for some reason, thought it came out in 2015 or 2016. And when I look back, I'm thinking, well, almost five years ago that your last new well, album came it, out. It, it, was, it was late 2014. It was August. So right. know, that's so, why it feels like it went into 15. It's a little under five years. But, I mean, now you got this cool thing that just came out, I guess, in September, the release of uh, Fuse 30 Reblown. Right. You know, the, the whole concept with that, because we were actually considering – getting together and putting our heads together and throw some music in a pile and, and see if we can come up with a new record. When Mark Shanker, our bass player, said, you know what, it's been 30 years since the release of Blow My Fuse and that, since that was the biggest record of your lives, you know, it might be a good campaign to, to get that thing remixed. And we got Bo Hill involved and the record company at Loud and Proud and everybody thought it was a great idea. So when Bo got his hands on the, on, on the actual tapes and got him to... Uh, got him to digital he he just did such an amazing job on it that uh, we were super proud of of what what he did to it and we were also fortunate enough that when the band broke up in 95 we just divvied up all the gear yeah i heard that Uh, some guys took uh uh, i took a couple a dads and a mackie board ronnie took all the 16 tracks and had all the original demo tapes so we actually had those available to include in this package. So it just all kind of fell into place so easily, and it turned out great. And it's crazy because it tape, I mean, I, my some of my cassettes from the from back in the 80s and in the 70s, I mean, if I could find a tape player, um, they don't look like <laughs> they would play very well. It's amazing that they're still, you know, the tape didn't deteriorate at all over, you know, 20-some years. I agree. They were they were boxed, and they, they were kept in a cool, dry place. And, uh, yeah, they, they, they transferred so easily. It, it, it was... It was too easy. And, you know, if anybody who's not aware, Blow My Fuse is what really kicked, I'll say it, kicked kicks into, you know, into stardom. I mean, you went from, you know, playing not smaller venues, but then you went to, like, you know, the full arenas, and you were headliners at that point. That was the record that got us out of the van and into the tour bus and out of the clubs and small theaters into arenas opening for bands like Rat and White Snake and Great White and all those great bands, Tesla, that, that we had an opportunity to play with. So, yeah, that was the biggest record of our lives, for sure. And then then, then the grunge thing came in yeah, and kicked I know. us the hell out of the party. I know. It's just crazy, because I was going to say that to you. 1995 came, and, you know, you're basically kicked out of the... the I, I hear this from all the bands of that era. They basically were... Tom Kiefer said, here we are. In a lim- they brought us in a limousine, and then we got into the uh, into the studio, and they escorted us out the back and told us not to come back. He said, "So it was, <laughs> it just you know, it just yeah. ended that quick for us." It w- it was a flush. It was like a total flush. And I, it was it was crazy because there were these bands. There was a lot of good bands that start. Well, I think the problem was there was a lot of bands that came in the early '90s that just tried to keep on duplicating everything that you guys exactly. were doing in the '80s. So there were so many exactly. of them. So many of them out there, and I think that kind of hurt it. it I call them cookie cutter bands. I mean, they just yeah, they just they, they all looked alike. They all started to sound alike. They all started to come up with the same kind of uh, concept and and music. And you know, have, have here's your power ballad, and here's your rock right. tune. And yeah, it got so predictable that when when the grunge thing kind of came in, it sounded fresh and original, and people thought, well, that's different. I like that. I never liked it. I never liked it either. <laughs> I never... I, you, know, you know, the thing that turned me off was that I felt that all the singers all had that same tone and growl in their voice. Like, n- there was no originality to the vocals, and, and there was no lead guitar. I never understood why they stared at their feet a lot, too. They sang up there, and they stared. It went from a party, you know, the big party we had in the 80s and even to the early 90s, and everything was fun. And it was like, I know. what's going on here? Why are people enjoying yeah, it... this? 
It, it was depressing, and and they all looked like they all wore flannel, and <laughs> just they all looked like no they needed a they needed a bath. That's what it looked like. Yeah, yeah. There was no showmanship at all. Now we did get a couple good ones out of there. I mean, we got the Foo Fighters, which I still like them, and you know they kind of Foo came, Fighters. They came out of the Stone Temple Pilots, right? Stone Temple Pilots, I thought was great. Um, yeah, th- there were a few. But a lot of them, and you know what happened? It's, it's karma because what happened to you guys with the guy? You know the the eighties bands happened to the grunge that became so many of them that they right. and they only You're last exactly right. they lasted what two years, three years at the most. You guys got a good you know fifteen year run before it all came down. If we were if we were together for eighteen years, and I can't say that that all of those were productive years. I mean, at, even though we we were making records and and playing a lot, you know, the recognition factor didn't happen until Blow My Fuse. And you also did this uh, talking about blow my fuse, the, you know the reblown version. Uh, Pledge, you did it through Pledge, uh, the Pledge campaign. Right. Now, where is this available? This is only is this still only available through Pledge, or are you able to get it? In- I think I think you can stream it now. We just wanted to go through through the Pledge uh, thing because it was uh, it was more profitable. You know, the, the money actually went into 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 our pockets instead of everybody else's. So we wanted to initially put it out that way, and then and then let it go to iTunes and, and all the other streaming ways of getting it. Imagine that, the money going into your pockets. Imagine that. That's a concept. What a concept. That's huh? a, you, who would have thought that, that you record the music, you make the music, you uh, do the concerts, you sell the, and then you uh, break even at the end? <laughs> it's, not, it's not a very <laughs> fair business, but... It, and, and if you didn't love it so much, you go, what the hell am I doing with myself? But you know, that's what I, if you don't like when, it. When it's, when it's in your blood and and you can't shake it, you know, then you just, you make the best of it. And uh, we're, we're at a point now in our careers that we are doing pretty well. In fact, I think we're doing better now than we ever have in our lives in this band. So, you know, th- things are good now. And, you know, if anybody ever saw Kicks in concert, I've seen you just about every year at M3. Which are going to be doing M three again this year, and of course it's you know your home your home it's your hometown basically in in Maryland. Um, everybody waits for Kicks to take the take the stage. I took my nineteen year old to M three for the first time, and she's into all this music, and she was blown away by the performance. She said, "What is this guy? Do? This guy is unbelievable. He's like you know you're running around the stage. You have a personality on stage. And one thing I could say about Steve Whiteman is he not only has a personality on stage, you could see that your personality is the same when you're talking to you." You don't change. No. Nice. It has to be that P- um, P90X I hear is your secret. <laughs> That's what keeps me going. I, <laughs> I, I, do, I do take care of myself because a 62-year-old guy can't run around a stage like that unless they take care of themselves. Well, you never know. 60, you know, I look at 62 and I see some 62-year-old guys and I'm like, look at the comparison when I see you know, guys like you on stage. And then I look at like, you know, men that are around me at the age of 62 that barely could get out of their car. Well, yeah, I, I remember, you know, you remember our parents that right. to you thought, Christ, they're old. Exactly, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. When we were like, when I was like 16, you looked at your parents when they were, you know, in their 40s, and you're like, God, they look old. Right. And now, <laughs> now here I am, because I'm uh, younger than you, but because I, I listened to you when I was in high school, but I look and think, God, I don't feel as old as these kids are probably looking at me and thinking I am. I agree. I, I don't. I don't know what's in the water these days, but people do seem to uh, look better, uh, feel better, last longer, more energy, um, and some don't. <laughs> some look like hell. And you know, the other thing about Blow My Fuse is you went out and you were doing concerts, uh, performing the album. And I got to imagine there were songs that you haven't performed in a long time that you now did live for you know maybe the first time. Absolutely. When uh, the when the idea came of let's let's not only put this thing out, let's get it remixed and 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 re-release it, but let's let's play the entire album live. And it's like, ooh, there's a couple songs on that record that I don't <laughs> think we ever played live. Like a uh, piece of the pie, we never ever played that song live. Um, Boomerang, we played for a little while, but not very long. And Dirty Voice was another one. It's it just hard. It's just really hard to play. Did you have to remember so, the lyrics? Or did you forget some of the lyrics to some of those songs? You know, I've kept all the lyrics that that every song we've ever written. I have them in a box, right? And I had I had to go to the box and, and go, "What the hell are those words?" Because I have no idea. <laughs> well, you know, let's. I want to go back a little bit because there's something I want to talk to you first. 1981, Kicks comes out. You, you t- I heard you say you wrote this in a, in the bars. When you were, you know, when you guys were doing all the clubs back then, is that true? Yeah, yeah. We we would uh, go over songs that were that were we were working on at Soundcheck. 
I mean, Donnie would come in with this rip, and the guys would riff on it for a while. Then we'd sit down and try to put some vocals to it. But it was mainly done in uh, Jimmy Chalfont's uh, dad's basement and, and at sound checks. And nothing like the only seven-minute song you'll ever hear by Kicks with Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. I mean, you guys aren't don't put out the seven-minute songs often. But seven. No, and you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but back then, it was, you know, uh, this type of band putting out a seven-minute song. And it's one of the I, – I, it's one of my favorites on the album, actually. Uh, unfortunately, you're not alone there. And it's a song that I'm so sick to death of, and, <laughs> and having to having to do that stupid rap every night. Uh, but <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. A, it, it, it's a fan favorite, so I just kind of suck it up and go, "Okay, here you come." And she threw up all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, last time we had a good laugh um, about Cool Kids because this to me was the the ultimate Kicks new wave album. You know, I don't. Oh, you, yeah. you channeled your inner Duran Duran and uh, <laughs> and 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 the Knack, which I guess is a compliment being compared to the Knack, but um, not so much Duran Duran, but the Knack. And it was a, I mean, it was a different sound. You got to, you I got to say that. Oh, absolutely, and and we were we were steered in that direction by producer, by management, by record company. We we took so much different music than what was on that record too that we thought we were going to record and they they the manager pretty much just said look you got to get on the radio or you're not going to keep your record deal and and it was the producer's job to to do what he felt was radio friendly so we had to bow and and listen to these people and we never ever embraced that album because we knew that it wasn't us and we did some uh, music on there written by other people that we did not like. Uh, Body Talk. Hot child, in, hot child in the City guy. Nick Gilder wrote that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's not a bad song. No. I just wish it, I, I wish we wouldn't have had to, to record it because right. it didn't do anything. And, you know, the, the rockers were on, on side two of the album. And um, it, it, that record, the, the making of that record with the people telling us what to do, how to do, where to do, when to do, just soured us to that record. I gotta say, I mean, I do play Cool Kids and Mighty Mouth, which sounded more like Kicks, like the Kicks we know. Right. That was another. Right. You know, Restless Blood, Mighty Mouth. There, there were some good tunes on there. Even Loco Emotion, because that's such a, a quirky right. song. But I always liked that one, and I got to play saxophone. See, you know what? You should do a Cool Kids tour and perform that album, start to finish. That'll never happen. <laughs> It was just a suggestion. I figured I'd go. To, I know. I'd I know. See it. But you go from you go from Cool Kids and you go to Midnight Dynamite was probably one of the best, if not one of the top ten best albums of the eighties as far as rock uh, albums went. I mean, this is when you hit your stride. You come out of Cool Kids and you think, oh God, what is the, what are they going to do next? Are they going to do classical or something? And then you hit Midnight Dynamite, and there you are. It's back. I totally agree. I I, I feel that I still feel that's probably our strongest record, but. Uh... Uh, the record label just didn't quite know what to do with us yet. And we thought having Bo Hill on board with all the success he'd have with Rat on Atlantic Records, we thought, this is a can't miss. And it missed because the record label just dropped the ball. One video, one promotional tour, done. And it's a Cold Shower is is one of these songs. I mean, and again, it had that bass line in it, which was a little bit different, but it's one of my favorite songs. And how that didn't, You're not alone. How didn't that become? I mean, how that didn't become some type of a radio hit back in the day? Look, I have no idea. And you, you said there was no promotion for it. No, I remember talking to Bo Hill about hitting that high note in that song, saying, "You watch, this will be the single, and I'll be singing this song the rest of my life." And sure enough.
spotlight. That's my favorite by Kicks. Cold shower. This week's Decades Artist Spotlight continues. Now, here's Joe E. Kramer with this week's artist. We are on the Decades Artist Spotlight tonight. Steve Whiteman from the rock band Kicks. Exploded in the 80s, of course. They've been talking a little about uh, Blow My Fuse, Reblown, which came out 30 years ago, by the way. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once there. But uh, they came out 30 years ago. Of course, they're celebrating that, playing the, the, uh, the album in the entirety, which is very cool. Um, we're going to have another Decades Artist Spotlight coming up. Graham Russell from Air Supply will be with us in a few weeks. So our next Decades Artist Spotlight, Graham Russell from Air Supply. Wanted to we go from kicks to air supply. How about that? We're going to be talking more to Steve White. We're coming up with more music from kicks. It happens right here on the river. 105 and 103.5. Hang on. This is the Decades Artist Spotlight. Northeast PA's The River.
is the Decades Artist Spotlight with Joe E. Kramer, this week's artist. We are on a Decades Artist Spotlight tonight. Steve Whiteman from the rock band Kicks. Blow My Fuse comes out, and like you said before, you hit the top 40. And you always make a comment about it in concert when you uh, get ready to play Don't Close Your Eyes. I mean, did that come, right. out, did that come out of left field that this song all of a sudden, after all these years... You know, you, it gets picked up on radio. It's being played all the time. Did you guys even expect that song to do as well as it did? We knew it, it was a good song, but um, we didn't want to be known for just that song. You right. know, they wanted to release that sooner, and we were like, "No, we don't want to. We don't want to put a ballad out yet. We want to let people know that we're a rock and roll band." And um, I, I really believe that a lot of the success of that record came from our hard work. After Midnight Dynamite was pretty much forgotten about and we we were determined to to get that record out to people so we took it upon ourselves to use our east coast bar money and do our own tours we, and we started traveling to detroit and chicago and uh, uh cleveland and cincinnati and went down through the south through texas and went to, to la and we thought this record's too good to not to not get out there and promote it so we amassed a a, a much bigger audience um than I think we ever had, and so when Blow My Fuse came out, that people were anxious to hear what we what we would come up with. And fortunately, we had MTV at the time, which was a real music channel, and they embraced the music and the band and the videos, and that's what really catapulted the band. Cold Blood. I mean, it's only a performance video, but I got to tell you, there was something. My friends and I, you probably know where I'm going with this, but that my friends and oh, I, yeah. that girl that was in that video, that video. She was- she was amazing. She, she was like Ali Sheedy. She does. It was amazing. We're like, look at, and I could tell you how many times we recorded on our VHS tape, and we'd be watching Cold Blood over and over, looking at this girl. And then we, first we thought she was somebody, and then we never could figure out who she was. But and it was like she vanished. That was it. Did you know who she was, or was she somebody somebody just brought no. to the set? I, she was somebody that the that the director brought in. Did she have any interest in meeting you guys, or did she just come there? Oh yeah, she's, yeah. She's very social, very nice. Said she liked the music, and you know, it it, it was kind of a goofy video because it was it was in like a a, a biker bar or right. something, and you know, all these all these rough neck guys were in there with this beautiful girls dancing, and we're just performing. It's like okay, what's okay, the no problem. And cold, I think Cold Blood became more of your anthem than than Don't Close Your Eyes. I know at least around. Around like this part with the rock radio and stuff. When you think of Kicks, the first song people say is "Cold Blood" before they say right. before they say "Don't Close Your Eyes" because that was like your rock anthem. Still to this day, that ex- when you play that in concert, I mean, the place blows up. Well, that one and "Blow My Fuse" are, are crowd favorites. "Blow My Fuse," you know, another one I like on it. Um, she dropped me to bomb. That's another good one I like. Yep. And uh, "Get It While It's Hot." These are all songs I play on my show all the time. And that album, you could just pick one after another. You know uh, of the stuff that, and it was. It, I think it was. It was probably your best. That had been Night Dynamite. I don't know which one you like better, but out of those two, they were my two favorites. Yeah, I, I, I hear that all the time. Now, Hot Wire, and we're gonna talk just a second about a couple of the other. You know, Hot Wire came out. Um, show business things started to, uh, I guess, start going south. Although I liked Hot Wire. I mean, it had Girl Money on it, which I, I bumped a la la, which is another song I play. Did you see the writing on the wall that things were starting to go in a different direction at this point? Yes, we we, we felt after we finished Hotwire and shot the video for Girl Money and saw just saw where MTV was going. They weren't they weren't playing us that much anymore. We saw yeah you know, we could tell that was the beginning of the end. And knowing that um, Atlantic you know pretty much was just dropped that record too. We thought we got to get off this label and get on a smaller label that's going to you know, actually pay attention to us, not accepting the fact that the whole music scene was going to change that drastically. So we gave them the live album, the Kicks live album, as uh, kind of like, you know, take this record, do whatever the hell you want with it, but let us off the label. And that's when we, we wound up with uh, CMC Records and tried to put show business together. But at that point, we knew that uh, the industry was, was totally different and uh, radio was different and MTV was just about gone. So it, it just changed dramatically. And, you know, everything kind of, you know, in 95, you guys broke up. You're in a band, you're, you're in a band called Funny Money. How did that lead um, to the reformation of Kicks? Yeah, Funny Money was my first band that I was actually able to write songs and perform my songs in front of real people. So I loved 
those years of, of playing in Funny Money. And I started out with, with five really good musicians that lasted like five years. And those guys had stars in their eyes thinking, well, if, if we're with Steve Whiteman, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get big. And unfortunately, it never happened. Right. You know, we were, we were just playing clubs and I was just happy doing that, knowing this is, this is where, this is about as good as it's going to get. So, uh, after a few years, of, a few of the guys left, and I was able to get Jimmy Schauf on, Jimmy Chocolate, in, into the band as our drummer. And he had been playing with Ronnie. Ronnie Yunkus had a band called Blues Vulture, still, still has. And Jimmy was playing with Ronnie once in a while, filling in. So one night, we had the Blues Vultures open for Funny Money. So we had Ronnie, myself, and Jimmy. So we got up at the end of the night, did a little kicks encore with us three, and the place just jumped and went crazy. And the club owner looks at us and goes, we got to get Brian in here. So we had Mark Shanker, uh, who played in Funny Money, and we thought, that's easy enough. Mark knows all this stuff. So we flew Brian in for a, for a, a show in Baltimore, and it sold out and went nuts, and we thought, okay, this is – this is too good to not do more often. So we just kept it regional for a while, in, you know, in our little comfort zones in Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia. And um, it, it was a, a, through a phone call from a, a guy named Sullivan Big, who, who was still our agent to this day. Yeah, he I know who he is. Kind of convinced me that he could, he could get this band booked all over the country. And I just laughed at him. I said, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And it took him a couple of days to convince me to even let him – have a try at it. And he booked us at Rocklahoma. So Rocklahoma is a big deal. Yeah, not, not like going from the, the clubs to Rocklahoma. That's a big that's a big jump. That's like going back that, to the eighties again. Exactly. But but he wanted to make a point. So we 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 agreed to do Rocklahoma and we get up in front of like twenty thousand people and and the people went ape shit. I mean it, it was like wow that we had no idea that this, these people would even know who we are. And it just opened all of our eyes, and we said, okay, take the ball and run with it. We'll do whatever you want to do. And it's just gotten better and better and shows more shows each year. So, like I say, we're in a good place right now. And, you know, it's an odd thing because because Kicks basically has stayed together. I mean, it's it's Brian, Ronnie, uh, obviously you, Jimmy, Mark, who is – people could say Mark's a new guy, but this guy's been in a band going on 16 years now. So right. it's not right. like he's it's not like he's a new guy anymore. Donnie, I mean, obviously has not been a part of this for a long time. But Mark's been in a band as long as you know his predecessor was for the most part. So he's people, yeah. people call him the new guy, but he's not new. He's you know it's hard to believe sixteen years. Well, Ronnie was the new guy in the Stones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you know these bands, a lot of bands today, and whether you agree with it or don't agree with it. You know, a lot of bands are going out there, and they have one member left. And you know, I know. It, you know, it might not—it's not not even be the singer. It might be the bass guitarist, and that bass guitarist wasn't with them for their first three albums. And you look at them, and it's like watching a cover band on stage. And I, whatever whatever you have to do to get paid, I understand that. But when does it you know stop and say, hey, this isn't fair to the fans who want to come out and see something that you know resembles the original band that you remember from your you know your teenagers. Yeah, I'm, a lot of people hear the name because you know that's the brand. They hear the name, they know the songs. They don't really care who gets up and performs. They just want to hear that music and by that band's name. And you know, it gets even more confusing when there's two or three uh, different versions of the band. You right, a about. couple LA Guns running around. <laughs> you got the Great Whites. You got the rats. LA Guns. You got the rats. You, you never know what's going on. So you record a new album in 2014. You know what? Nowadays, I mean, the album did well. It was your second highest charting album when it came out, and it, you know, went to number one on the Amazon Rock Chart. It's a lot different now. I mean, you sell twenty, thirty thousand copies of an album, unless you're Taylor Swift. That's got to be, you know, considered a huge success. I know, isn't that crazy? It I is mean, that's, nuts. That's, so, that's so misleading to me. It's like um, when uh, it was on the charts for like two weeks, and then it's gone. I know, so, um, and. There, there's no money to be made in, in putting records out. It's just, it really is for the diehard fans and for your own creativity. You know, you just want to keep the juices flowing. So you kind of do it for yourself as a band and for the diehard fans. And that's, that's, and you don't have high expectations for it. And you're still doing some, you're doing your teaching too, right? 
Yeah, yes, I'm still teaching. And exactly what are you, what are you doing? For those who don't know, Steve Whiteman is a professor. I guess you could call him professor of music here. Uh-huh. And uh, you still do the <laughs> – it sounds really good, doesn't it? I, I like it. Uh, um, but you do, you do uh, obviously, vocals, correct? Yeah, I do vocals. And I used to teach in the Harrisburg area, but I've recently relocated. There's a, a new school that opened up in Hagerstown that is five minutes from my house. So I've abandoned the Baltimore and the Harrisburg location just to teach exclusively out of this new school in Hagerstown. And the beauty of this school is I can do online vi- uh, online lessons. So I have one day of one-on-one lessons, and I have one day of people calling in and doing video lessons. So it's, it's, it's the best of both worlds, and, and it keeps me busy. And I bet some of the parents are more, ex- are more excited that Steve Whiteman is, uh, is teaching their child than the kids. The kids probably think, you know, He's just my teacher. Just don't not, have a clue. No clue. No clue whatsoever as to who you are. Um, well, that uh, un, unless the parents go on and you know pull up some videos on YouTube and go, "Here's your teacher," and then they get impressed. <laughs> they go, "Oh man, where'd you get that?" MTV used to play music. Wow, YouTube is the only <laughs> YouTube is the only place you can see music videos now. It seems crazy, but exactly. It, it's, I know it sucks. It's the only place now. You talked about new music, but I heard a, a rumor that Kicks might be a. Going in the studio sometime and uh, putting out some more new music. I'm surprised we haven't been uh, talking about it because January and the mid February is usually our downtime. There's, there's really not a whole lot going on. But um, I think Brian's been in the in the midst of moving. He's he's leaving Los Angeles. I think he's moving to Tennessee. Mark's been doing a lot of deep sea diving, and I've just been enjoying the time off. But um, there there's talk of us of us uh, getting together. Our first step is to just everybody who's who has anything worth listening to throw it in a pile and then we'll probably send that off to taylor rose who who produced the last record and see if he feels like we've got some some good numbers that that he that excite him and make him think yeah we we could we could probably do this again so that's the first step you know it is a different world obviously touring is probably the biggest thing and you're coming in uh, my neck of the woods my studio is about 140 miles north of uh of Philadelphia. I'm actually around the Pocono region. Everybody, I guess, knows what uh-huh. the Poconos are. But you're going to be coming up to Penn's Peak, I believe, in March. Right. And uh, Mike Tramp will be opening up for you, too, I believe. Yeah, yeah. That, Mike's an old friend. Known him forever. And I'm going to have Mike on the show coming up in a couple of weeks, and he has a new album out. So it's like a... It, but you didn't mix with those guys in the 80s, though. A lot of these, Some of these bands you're playing with now, you didn't really... You know, you didn't tour a lot with in the 80s, and some of them you did. So it's like a reunion of sorts now when you see them. Now we see them all at, at at the festivals and at the Monsters of Rock cruise. So yeah, we run into each other quite a bit now. So you got a lot of opportunities to see Kicks coming up. First of all, in uh, March around here, we're going coming up to Penn's Peak. But uh, M three M three, of course, in May. If nobody's ever been to M three and you're big into this eighties rock music, it is the place to go. I to go every year with my daughter, and it is an experience. And you know, it's a great place to see. Tons of bands, and this year's lineup is just as good. Of course, Kicks is always there, and I think you're on Friday night this year. Yeah, we usually headline the Friday night. It started out as a one day festival, and then uh, it just it, it exploded, and people wanted more. So they thought, well, um, let, let's just give Kicks their own their own headlining night, and then put some other bands uh, uh, below them. And now the Fridays are just as 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 much fun, or if not better, than the Saturday night. So. Yeah. Yeah, that that's come a long way. I think I think this is the eleventh year for it. Right, because it was a tenth anniversary last year, year number eleven. If you've never been to the Merriweather Pavilion, it's a gorgeous place to see a concert. So if you're going to go to an outdoor it's, show, it's a great place. You know, uh, there's there's so many venues that I won't go to because it it just sucks to get there. But Merriweather is, is just so well thought out. The infrastructure is great. It's easy in, is easy out. It's it's a great venue. And you've played at Penn's Peak before. You don't get better acoustics than playing at Penn's Peak. That place, I love that place. That place is phenomenal to play in. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. We're on the Decades Artist Spotlight. Steve Whiteman, extraordinary, what did I say, frontman extraordinaire for the, for the <laughs> band Kicks is with us. Hey, Steve, as always. God of thunder. <laughs> you better not say that. You'll be getting, you'll be getting sued because that's probably copyrighted. No, uh, you're probably right. <laughs> you never know. You never know with Kiss. Um, Steve Whiteman from Kicks here in a Decades Artist Spotlight. Steve, as always, it's fantastic to have you on the show. My pleasure. Hey, 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 I'm Steve Whiteman from Kicks, and you are rocking and rolling with Joey Kramer on Decades.
Decades Artist Spotlight continues. Now, here's Joe E. Kramer with this week's artist. You know, there's a lot of great people I have talked to. I've done you know hundreds of interviews, and Steve Whiteman is up there with uh, some of the best. He really is. And uh, thank him again for joining us. He was on about five years ago, which we we're trying to figure out the, the time period. And uh, about five years ago, he was on the show. And uh, again, getting him on again was well, yes, fantastic. He's a great guy. Coming up a couple weeks, our next Decades Artist Spotlight, we have uh, Graham Russell from Ear Supply. We're also going to be talking to Mike Tramp, who has a brand new album coming out. I think it'll be out uh, in a day or two. It's actually online already. You can pre-order it. So. But we'll have Mike Tramp on the show, too. So, hey, we're going to get a bunch more interviews. We're going to keep them pumping out throughout the year. And, uh, hey, if you have any requests for people you want to be to try to talk to, <laughs> it's not easy. You can always uh, send me an email, decadesontheriver at yahoo.com, or go over to my Facebook page, Decades with Joey Kramer. we got more Decades coming up. Uh, we're going to do Culture Club. We're going to play the air, some air supply, Buckner and Garcia, and a very, very lost track from Jack Wagner. It's not all I need. It's his other General Hospital song. So hang on for that. More Decades coming up.